I got asked all the time coming out of the eating disorder as I was starting to win races in cycling, have you replaced one addiction with another? Maybe, but did you see me before? Because I was dying. So I'm going to say this one's not too bad. When I learn about your story, you know, obviously the Olympics is a huge part of it. Your move to a plant-based diet is a huge, I mean, it's it's a massive part of your story. But um, I haven't heard too much about when it comes to the early years. Now, I knew you grew up kind of in the South, but what drew you to wanting to be a model? Because Because that's an interesting thing to me. I mean, there's like a desire, there's like a hunger there. There's like a willingness to be judged and put yourself out there when you want to be a model. So what what happened that led you down that path? Well, you know, uh, you know, in life, sometimes we just sort of stumble upon things. And that was truly like that for me. It wasn't anything that I thought about when I was uh, taught growing up in, in Kentucky. Uh, I was always, you know, taller than the boys and kind of lanky and, you know, really long legs. Like and, seven, eight, yeah. nine to be like taller than everyone. <laughs> exactly. It's a prerequisite. Um, but I was just towards the end of uh, college. I went to Villanova and uh, right outside Philadelphia and, uh, an agency in Philadelphia is a small, smaller agency. Uh, I met somebody just out one day and they suggested that I come in and I was waitressing working really hard. You know, I had big loans out for school, uh, great restaurant, uh, on the main line in, uh, at, right near Villanova. And, but, you know, was making, maybe $75 a night back then, yeah. uh, maybe a little less. So it was just, it was just alluring to see, oh, yeah, that sounds like that could be fun to try out. I've, I'm definitely someone who loves to explore new things. So that's really all it was. And then you, like, wh where did that come from? I've been like that since I was born. Mom said wow. I came out of her womb saying, I do it. Don't <laughs> help me. I, I don't know. I think it's just, <laughs> you know, some of it was, was mom encouraging for sure. Uh, but, but I think it's just sort of, I, I just find it to be so much more, I feel so much more alive and it's so much more exciting to try something that, and you don't know what the outcome is going to be. Really? Like, I love that, 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 that space where you feel, um, petrified. It makes me feel more alive than contentment or happiness or, or even love. Like, it just, I just get this high off of like, just the, um, the not knowing and, and what could possibly lay ahead. Sometimes it's great. And sometimes it's not. And that was like, the modeling thing was like mediocre. It was definitely more money than waitressing. So yay on that paid my school loans off faster than I would have and had some fun and went with an agency in New York city. But then I, I got, I got kind of bored with it. And I also got sick at, during that period of time. So anyway, but yeah. It's not like this really cool, you know, I wanted to be a model since I was five story. And then I'm like, you know, grace the runways and uh, I wouldn't like that. <laughs> no, but it, but it, it's interesting because it speaks to your willingness to kind of throw yourself into things. I mean, uncertainty, you know, like a lot of people don't like, they either get addicted to throwing themselves into things and then they beat themselves up for not following through and not sticking with things, or they dream of things, but never actually take the leap because the uncertainty is just too risky. But is it, you know, like it's, what's it really ever going to be on the other side, right? Like just failure, just like, oh, I wasn't <laughs> just, great. At just failure, just embarrassment. <laughs> they would say just judgment and ridicule. I mean, that's what, that, right. that's what people who haven't gone on to the Olympics would say, right? <laughs> That's what you have to disconnect from, as you well know, as everybody knows, is is uh, is the outward view of you and, and what people think. Because, you know, one thing I learned in the Olympic journey uh, that was really helpful to me from my sports psychologist, I had basically made in my own head kind of created this magnitude of the Olympics, right? It's a big deal, but it's also just a sporting event and it, you know, it passes, you know, it go, you move on and, and then you move on into your life. And so, but I was ex struggling from extreme nerves uh, before competition and especially leading into Olympics, like being at the Olympic games. And so she helped me um, to bring down uh, the magnitude of the event 
we, we turned that conversation into my three minutes of opportunity. Cause that's really what it was. My event is a little over, over three minutes, but we brought down the magnitude of the event because here's what she said. I was worried about what everyone was going to think if I sucked or we lost, or I was the part of the team that brought us down or, you know, didn't have us come across the line first. And she said, you know what, Dotsie, nobody cares. They're focused on themselves. People are, are focused on themselves and what they're doing and their output and their, whatever it is, no one's cares. They're not sitting there watching just you and like, aha, she failed. No one's doing that. Cause honestly, they just don't care enough. So that, I take that, I've taken that from that moment into the next 10 years of my life. Cause it's so true. People are focused on themselves, right? We're inherently egotistical and that's what we're doing. So no, no one's out there watching every step that you make to see if you like win or don't win or fail or succeed. And they don't know they're not paying attention. Huh. That, that, I mean, that I, I I've heard it a lot, you know, you know, the idea of like in your twenties, you want, you worried what people think about you and your thirties, yeah. you don't care or whatever in your forties or fifties as you're older, like you realize no one's paying attention to you. Um, <laughs> that's like a good thing and a bad thing, but, but I've never heard it so pointed where it's just like, really, you can let go because no one gives it. Right? <laughs> like, like it mm. feels, I was saying to my wife last night, cause, cause, um, I, I have anxiety, I have G- GAD, I have generalized anxiety disorder. And things okay. are really amped up at home. And um, and my wife and I are talking about some things. And I said, I said, it just feels like the stakes are so high. And then I mm. paused and I went, but the stakes have always felt high. And when I look back, I realized none of that mattered. Mm-hmm. But the stakes feel so high. And so, mm. um, you, you know, you're facing the Olympics. And we've kind of flashed forward from modeling to the Olympics. But But I've never heard someone be so pointed about the fact that yeah, because the stakes just seem so high all the time, don't they? They definitely can. And that's definitely where I was. But but now traversing life outside of being an Olympic athlete and outside of sport and in business and nonprofit work, uh, especially the work I do, which is to stand up for the voiceless. I mean, at the end of the day, that's that's my that's my passion, that's my power in my heart, and that's what I'm doing. And so in doing that, I can either get completely and totally overwhelmed by the magnitude of the injustices and the killing. Mm. So in the last second, 265,000 lives were taken in the U.S. alone for our food. So that can either be so overwhelming that it, you know, freezes me, you know, I'm just, just frozen and not able to do, or I can choose the other side of that, which this is going to sound kind of flippant, but it's, does any of it really matter at the end of the day? I mean, mm. maybe we're going to find out when we're gone, but it, it, it's, it's, it's the yin and the yang. It's a black and the white. It's like, it all intensely matters so much every day, which is what keeps you fighting. And then at the end of every day, when I kind of close the laptop or whatever I'm doing, I kind of move into that. I don't know if it matters at all mm. or not. And that kind of just keeps me settled and just kind of keeps me moving forward and keeps me, keeps me wanting to fight because the, the, the intensity of it, what you're talking about, the magnitude of it, the stakes of it can just get so overwhelming that you, you, well, a, you can't do your work, but B like, you know, from what you're saying, um, it is debilitating and it can debilitate your enjoyment of your experience of life. Cause that's all we're having here is an experience of this version of us on earth that whatever that is going to be is up to yeah. us. Yeah. That's interesting. So I, I want to make sure that of course our audience knows your backstory a little bit. And so um, not to park too much on it, but after modeling, you know, you mentioned real quick that you got sick, but um, mm-hmm. you know, you, you, you were living with anorexia um, with bulimia. Um, I've seen references to, to kind of drug issues and things like that. What led to that? moment because that is I have to be careful here you know like I have a family member who's who's been working through this and struggling through it for a long time and hospitalized quite a bit oh wow um and I never know what words to say other than having witnessed it I realized that the moment where it gets bad is way after the stuff that really happened 
That's my outsider's perception. You know, the moment where people mm -hmm. take notice, the moment where it becomes serious is like, you almost can't unweave why or where this comes from. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. It's different for everybody. Well, for your first or your second question that you don't know what to say, because I get asked that all the time by uh, mostly parents, mostly parents of, of children that are struggling. And it, all it is, is I love you. You're worth it. Every, every parent, I'll, because it really is almost always parents, you tend to think, just because there's not quite enough education out there, that eating disorders are kind of their own separate thing uh, in, in relation to, um, or in comparison to, I should say, a drug addiction or alcohol addiction or sex addiction or any other kind of focused addiction. An eating disorder is just the vehicle that we've chosen to act out on our pain. So instead of alcohol, it's deprivation and starving mm -hmm. uh, for a variety of different reasons. Mine was a, a deep need to have control over mm -hmm. a life at that period that I felt like I didn't have control over, but it's really never about the food. Cause what you want to say is what my dad said to me, bless his heart. Can, can we just go get a cheeseburger? Can we just sit down together? Because, you know, because it seems like it's about the food because alcohol is about the alcohol, but it's also about the way that you're acting. I mean, they're pain, but you have to take all the alcohol out. Right. It, yeah. it, period. I mean, that alcoholics have told me that anyway, but with food, like you can't put it all in or take it all out. Like you have to create a healthy relationship with it because to, to live, you, you, you have to eat. So, um, it's just a way to act out on pain. Hmm. You know, it's not its own specialized, totally different than, than, than all of the others. So knowing that I think with any, any, anytime anyone's fighting for their life through an addiction, uh, it's, I love you and you're worth it. That's it. And really back that love up. Uh, of course, that has to be there. I'm just here. I'm just here. I'm going to be here. You're not, you're not going to be alone in this because it always takes the person who's suffering to finally get to the point where they want to change. And if they don't ever get there, you know, obviously people die of anorexia, they die of alcoholism, they die of drug yeah. addiction. It's, you know, yeah, I can, I can see that and I can understand it. What, Mm -hmm. what, what pain were you? And I, I mean, you know, this isn't therapy, of course, and I apologize if it's too direct, but what pain were you <laughs> okay. through that led you to, to that? Yeah. You know, uh, I, in the beginning, I was kind of embarrassed by this because it's not like, oh, I was sexually molested when I was four or some horror story, uh, about 35% of eating disorder sufferers have been a victim of early childhood abuse. Mm -hmm. So it's so very, very, very common uh, in, in the eating disorder uh, sphere. No, I was, I grew up with a fantastic family, extremely supportive and loving and encouraging. Um, but I was graduating college and this is just kind of one of those things people can just relate to. Cause it's not this, like, it's, it's really, I, I really felt quite silly for a while, but I was graduating college. I had majored in journalism. I was hard pressed. I'm going into hard news. You know, I wanted to go all over the world and tell the story right from the streets. And I did this internship at a station in Philadelphia and long story short, it, it became clear to me that um, journalism is, is controlled by big business and our government and some kind of, you know, combination of the two. And, mm -hmm. uh, I was never in the really in, you know, intense meetings when they would decide to kill stories. But all I know is an intern, I'm out on the desk and we're going to do this really cool story. And it, then we're not. And so I became extremely disillusioned and frightened because now I'm graduating. I have this degree. I've had this dream. And I just, I suddenly go, I don't, that's not what I want to do with my life. I mean, that is not what I want to do. Um, looking back, I maybe should, could have gone into sports reporting. That could have maybe been a fun career. I don't know, but, um, but I was absolutely terrified. I had these huge school loans uh, and I was getting ready to graduate. I didn't really have money to go back and, you know, learn something else or pay for that. And that just spiraled that fear mm -hmm. 
Then I started self-loathing, like how could you have not have seen this and you idiot. And so a lot of self-loathing started, but it was really just born out of a deep fear. And because of now, I didn't know quite what I was going to do. Um, I just very slowly started to control my intake of food. And now that I look back and have had years of therapy, I understand that I was just trying to usurp some control over my mm. life. And, mm. and, and that, that's how it came out uh, for me. It's hard to starve yourself. And so you, you, once you are you know, successful in quotes, right, at it for a bit, you get a high off of it. It's yeah. also euphoric to when you're the challenge, when you're starving. The difficulty, yeah. <laughs> Definitely. I'm on, I'm on a cut. I mean, I'm not on a I'm a bit of a cut right now, but I'm going through I'm finishing off this health challenge. Okay. And um because I've always been overweight. I've always been heavy. Okay. And so they had me cutting and cutting under nutrition control, under, you know, all of this stuff, tracking, mm -hmm. meal planning and stuff. But over Easter, I was at sixteen hundred dollars sixteen hundred calories a day. And I'm burning like 4,000 calories a day and working out. Oh God. And so I was just like sitting there at Easter dinner, watching my wife eat this stuff. And I was like smelling it. And I was just like, oh, I'm going to drink my <sighs> tea. I'm going to drink my herbal tea. And, and as hard, I mean, I'm not comparing those two things at all, but, but I can understand the like feeling of like, I am a rock star for being able to put myself in this terrible yeah. position and not give in. And it, there is like a little performance high from it yeah almost. it's what perpetuates it into getting really really scary because and and then i don't know if you've noticed on those calories i, I mean i was down to just a couple hundred a day and you it's a couple hundred certainly, a day yeah it, it, it's certainly mental i mean for sure and emotional but it's also a physical euphoria which i'm pretty sure was you know uh set in from you know 500 years ago when you know, you had to run around and find food. And if there wasn't yeah. any, um, yeah. you're, and you're starving, you're in a, in a, your body releases enough endorphins that it is, feels a little bit euphoric and you're not in very much pain in case you were, I, I'm, I'm convinced it's, you know, the body's yeah. vehicle to save us, um, from the pain of, of starving to death. So there's a incredible euphoria that it unfolds physically. Yeah. And then you've got the mental high that you just talked about and it's dangerous those two yeah. together. Yeah. And so in, in recovery, in, in therapy, mm -hmm. your, your, um, your professionals who are supporting you suggest go get into something active. Now I I've heard that you've picked biking on a whim and I think that's cool, but how do you go from picking cycling to going, I'm going to become an Olympic athlete. <laughs> like, like that, that is a massive shift, isn't it? Yeah. Well, yeah. So it was 13 years later after I first picked up a bike and I never said I am going to become an Olympian or I want to become an Olympian until it, it came into my sphere that it was a possibility. So I didn't start cycling. And then, you know, like within six months, you're like, Oh, you know, it was like that. Well, that would have been laughable six months in clearly, uh, that, so it was just, um, yes, my therapist suggested to be able to, um, move my body in a healthy way again, because I had the part of anorexia as well, the over-exercise part where I would spend hours and hours in the gym trying to melt myself away. And so, uh, bringing that, you know, that healthiness back into my life of being able to move my body. And she said, I just kind of want you to pick something that sounds good. That doesn't, you know, um, entail the tread mess, treadmill or the stairmaster, all the gym stuff. So I was living out in LA by the time. And I was like, well, what if I got a bike? Cause I, I just loved driving up and down PCH. And I just thought, God, how cool would it be if I was on a bike and like wind in my face and just like that feeling that, uh, of freedom really, that was that, that I was craving. Cause I had been in the chains of my anorexia and bulimia for, uh, five and a half years by that point, almost six. So I just chose cycling and I just, I literally, and I'm not, I'm, I, I'm not kidding. I just never stopped. It was like a, I fell in love with it on almost on day one and it became this, it was a beautiful, uh, I, I love the, I like to express myself on the bike. I mean, there's, there's a certain artistic movement about cycling. Um, but I also just started really getting into and enjoying the, can I get better? 
Can Mm -hmm. I get a little better? Can Mm -hmm. I get a lot better? Can I, you know, and I just kept going and I lost way more times than I win any athlete. I don't even care if you're Michael Phelps, he's lost more than he's won, you know, and it's, 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 it's exciting to push past those boundaries and those barriers and, and all of those losses and keep keep going. So, so, I mean, from an outsider point of view, it would appear that, you know, your, your, um, your love of adventure, your love of trying new things, your aggressive commitment to things that led you perhaps to wanting to control with anorexia would, you know, doesn't to connect these dots seems pretty simple to me to say then you then applied that towards cycling with the same level of determination and, and all of these things in your experience, because I have a somewhat, uh, my wife would say, I have a pretty addictive nature. You know, she's like, why do you have to be all or nothing on everything all the time? And so yeah, I'm trying to figure out for myself, like, is moderation even a thing? Or is it just about just direct this fireball of energy on something slightly more healthy and less deteriorating than something else? Is, is that what it comes down to? Yeah, I don't know. Only you can answer that for you. Well, for me, but what about I mean, for you? Uh, no, I'm not a very good moderation person. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, you get better at it, right? Like you just, or else, because you're just, you're not always like, "Ah!" you know, that (laughs) like, oh my gosh, uh, that's not sustainable. I I don't think for forever. And, and I, and I'm finding myself kind of stepping into it more than I ever have as I, as I age, you know, and just literally like wanting to enjoy the essence of what life is, you know, as you like, I'm 48. So, you know, moving into my fifties and you're right, you're right. It's like, I don't give a shit anymore. I don't care what anyone thinks I, I'm doing this for me and I want to enjoy my life with my husband. And, um, so starting to feel more moderate, um, moderation coming in, but I, I don't think I'll ever be, you but know, did you like take your, did thing. you take your focus and aggressive nature from control with anorexia to recovery, to cycling, to, um, professional athlete, to protein or, or food-based, uh, um, non-animal-based diets to your mission of your nonprofit? Like, is it just the same, like you're just focusing this flame with the same level of aggression? On, oh, I'm quite on sure. Every single- <laughs> I'm quite sure. Yeah. I had so the a, answer isn't yeah. for us to change. The answer is just to direct it to good, basically. Yeah. I mean, I think if, right. And make sure that you're, you know, you're kind of balancing those aspects of your personality that can get you in trouble. You know, the, the, the danger side where you could push so hard that you could become very sick or you could put yourself in danger, but yeah. And I, I, you know, I got asked all the time, like coming out of the eating disorder as I was, you know, starting to win races in cycling, like, have you replaced one addiction with another? And that, for, that the first time I was even asked that question, I was like, maybe, but did you see me before? Cause I was dying. So I'm going to say this one's not too bad, you know, like, right. I don't, I, sure. But you, I, I'm still me. Like we're not going to edit a race, like part of me in therapy. No, we just tried to bring the, the, the healthy me out of therapy so that I could do something yeah. that was productive. Yeah. And the reason I'm only asking this is because, um, and, and I'm curious, I, I'm not even mm-hmm. trying to lead you anywhere. I'm just curious whether I, I hear from a lot of people answers that I don't like. So, so <laughs> Well, it's true. I just, I don't, I don't like the answer. You know, like I'm finishing off this challenge and my nutritionist who is a wonderful person keeps trying to tell me, trying to teach me lessons that I don't have any interest in learning. Oh, like, so when it comes to food, I really love the structure that I'm working under because it gives me a sense of freedom of knowing like, oh, I can still achieve my goals. I eat these, I eat what they tell me to eat when they tell me to eat it the time of day. And they're like, no, that's not what it's about, Mark. It's about food freedom. It's like, I don't want food freedom. Like I feel free in this structure because then I don't have to constantly worry about what am I eating and when am I eating it? And Mm -hmm. is it the right thing or the wrong thing or too much or too little? It removes all of that. Now I feel free knowing that if I do this, it works. And so it, it, so I think a lot of times people Mm -hmm. who are more aggressive or um, more high achievers are fighting for goals are surrounded with people saying it's about moderation. It's about balance. It's about this. You need mm. to change. And it's just like, no, like, how about we just take, stop trying to change us. How about we take the, uh, the, the, the focus or that energy and direct it to the things that are maybe more healthy than the negative things. But right. I'm just, I'm, I'm playing this out in real time, whether moderation is really the answer, or it's just about directing who you are on the things that really matter most. 
Yeah, I think that's it. You know, it, it's it, it really when you're when you were just saying that, I was thinking, who is he to define what freedom means for you? Right. He's got all of his own issues because we all have them. Right. We all bring all of our own issues to the table. And most of the time you're trying to unravel your own issues on other people when you're, mm. you know, guiding them or coaching them, you know, because that's your frame of reference. That's yeah. your experience. So you have a lot of it because you're, you know, whatever, how many ever years you've lived this experience. So it just sounds like to him, the definition of, of food freedom is what you just said to you. That may not be your definition. Yeah. I love that, that you, it's, you, you get to make it whatever it means for you. Yeah. That's okay. Well, thank you for reinforcing my bias. Yeah. I love yeah. it. Now, I, I do want to. I do want to have a, a conversation around plant-based diets. Um, and I know that. So, so in your story, um, you know, you saw one of those terribly horrific, um, really violent shows on television late one night that that just shows what can happen um, in you know slaughter homes in mm-hmm. um, in. Uh, factory farming and things like that. Mm-hmm. So I've seen them and I've always immediately discounted it as well. Sh- I mean, like any, like I, I have 15 years of marketing experience. I've run an agency. I know that I can, I can, I, I know that I can pick and choose what I want to show people to have them elicit sure. a certain response. Right, right, so right. I always look at it and go, well, you know, I'm Canadian and our farming practices are different than Americans, you know, and, and our, our stuff is, you know, different than maybe what happens mm-hmm. uh, out of South America, where maybe a lot of beef might come from or things like that. So, so I've always just thought like, well, don't show me the worst of it. And then assume that that happens everywhere. Um, I, I know that this moved you so much that you went like, not only did it move you so much that you went plant-based, but you, you like, had the mission of proving that as a professional athlete, you do not need Mm -hmm. animal products in order to get the protein you need or in order to get the recovery that you need or anything like that. But I I love the outcome. I love the outcome of you going (laughs) against what people think can't happen and you proving them wrong. I'm just wondering why, why is this really that important aside from the numbers and the CO2 and the water and the stats? And it's just like all that green stuff that most people just don't care about. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, I was like you when I, I saw the first, uh, videos in, in that I was like, Oh, you know, this is America and that, that must be going on in another country. Like you <laughs> Canada, like this, yeah. this wouldn't go on here because the government seems like they should be protecting and serving their people. And that would of course include our food system, <laughs> our food itself. Uh, so I went a lot deeper you know, and I, mean, I, I definitely needed to see more than one or two, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but as I went deeper and saw it time and time and time again, and over and over and over again, um, and, you know, knowing that, you know, so you know, marketing most, if not all marketing behind all that, uh, behind all marketing is, uh, uh, you know, a revenue goal, right? Mm-hmm. You're, you're trying to show what you want people to see and believe so that they will then do something. Right. So yes revealing these, <laughs> we're not making any money off of showing you the, the horror of what's really going on behind closed doors. Like there's really nothing to be had from that, but compassion maybe, you know, and, and maybe, so it's really just, but for me, you know, we're all wired totally differently. I am, I, I am an empath, which took, mm. it took me five years to really uncover what that truly means. And a couple books later of what diving in. What does that mean for you? So people can have sympathy where they feel sorry for, for somebody else. They can have empathy where in a moment you have a, your, your wife, a really good friend come to you and they're in pain. And probably with your wife, you feel like you can almost, you're almost experiencing it with her. That's empathy. Like you're kind of feeling through what she's, um, what she's feeling. It's not just, you don't just feel sorry for her, but you feel your blood pressure kind of rise and and maybe your heart rate rise. An empath is somebody who does that, but also takes that experience and feeling on as if it were them. Mm. So it is a whole never another level, I guess I could say of intensity 
um, when I think about or experience what goes on behind closed doors in our food system. And at this point, I've gone way behind the videos. I've, I've been inside these places that you're talking about, maybe a little undercover, uh, maybe not. I've been to multiple sanctuaries multiple times and spent time with these rescued animals and gotten to know them. And that's it. That that's it. That's the biggest difference really between you can see these videos and you could go, Oh God, that's really horrible. That sucks. But it's just a pig, but it's just a cow. And the truth is we would never ever in a million years say that that's okay with your dog. And the reason is, is because you know, your dog, you know, dogs, you, not you, I have no idea, but most people, 98% of people in the world say they would not want to cause suffering to an animal. 98% of people, <laughs> there's only like 6% of us that don't eat them. in the world. <laughs> so obviously that's an enormous disconnect. And I think the biggest part of that, the reason for that disconnect is, is because we haven't gotten to know these other animals. So we just, we do it to people too. We don't know people in Afghanistan, we don't know people in Indonesia, whatever. Mm -hmm. And we don't have the same empathy mm -hmm. for them and their experience and what they're going through as we do the people that we do know, the people yeah. that, so going to sanctuaries and experiencing these individuals, experience these animals as individuals <sighs> changes everything because they are very complex. They have very complex systems. They have very intimate relationships. They remember things. They do things very methodically. It's 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 all the things that mammals are, you know. Yeah. So that's uh, that was the big that was the biggest leap for me is to is to really spend time with them. And I think I just it was it was just a, it was a soul shift for me. That's all it was. It was just like I've always said I loved animals. I grew up with ton ton of animals. And if I love something, that probably doesn't include putting it on my plate and eating it like mm. you, right. That doesn't make any sense. You don't eat things you love. Yeah. Um, so except I love broccoli and I will put that on my plate, but <laughs> you don't eat things that are alive that you love. Maybe I should say. So it was just like, if I'm going to be true to myself, then that's just, this is just now my new way forward, I guess. And I'm going to figure it out. So I did. Oh, that's so, that's so cool. And I appreciate the breakdown so much actually, because what I realized as you were describing that is I'm actually not a very sympathetic person. Mm -hmm. I am certainly not an empath, but I'm ex I believe that I'm extremely empathetic. And so mm. I, I am very, very good at actually being able to place myself in someone else's shoes, imagine what it might be like and, and actually visualize it and take it on and all of that stuff. But as soon as the like visual is closed, it's like, you know, like, like right. off, off I go with my day. And so being able yeah. to understand from your point of view, um, the, the, it's not just a level of commitment. It's not just a mission, but mm -hmm. the fact that this is a heart felt, um, compassion based movement. I can just respect, I, I can just respect that more, you know, it's like, mm. um, and I, I don't equate these two things, but you know, I live, I live just outside of Toronto up in Canada. Okay. Uh, I was going to ask, cause I want to take you to a sanctuary. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I'm, I'm just outside of Toronto in Canada. Um, you know, we have a lot of, uh, pork industry. We have a lot of uh, chicken farms. I, I, I have family members who are, um, in the dairy, um, you know, are, are, are milk, milk farmers under the milk control board and all that stuff. But sometimes, you know, and this is maybe my cynical side, but for example, my wife's favorite restaurant moved from plastic straws to paper straws. Paper straws don't work. Okay. They, they don't work <laughs> at all. And it's not a good solution. And, and I, yeah. I got upset and I said, why are we now moving to paper straws? And they said, well, because straws are terrible for the ocean. And I was like, we don't live anywhere near the ocean. Like the, the chances of the straw that we're using, and I understand the move from plastic to paper or, or kind of mm -hmm. biodegradable products, mm -hmm. but we don't live anywhere near the ocean. There's no turtle, there's no, there's no fish, there's no one who is gonna come across this straw from our like landlocked area to be affected by this. And so, um, so when it's big corporations, when it's big movements, when it's just like, let's get on the bandwagon, I am super cynical of, of the mm -hmm. motivations behind it. Mm -hmm. But when someone like you is, is driving a mission or driving a story forward, and then when you go on to say like, Hey, as a professional athlete, I'm going to make this change that my coaches won't like that, that my nutritionists won't like, and I have to prove to them that I can still perform as an athlete under 
mm-hmm. these new challenges, that's where I'm like, damn, I got to talk to this woman. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> because, because the resistance you might, must have received when you started to say, this is what I'm doing and how I'm doing it. Um, and then to be able to perform and, and having to prove not only that your diet and that your life choices will help you perform better, but that like, that must've been something you were fighting up against. Well, I didn't advertise it. I will tell you that I do now, but I didn't like at the time it wasn't, it was so personal to me. And I, it's not like I then ran the next day to training. It was like, I'm going to do this now. And, you know, cause I was like, Oh God, I hope, I hope I remember just thinking, I just hope I stay the same, Mm. you know, like I was on track to make the Olympics. If I didn't get injured or somebody didn't suddenly get much better than I was, you know, I was, it was looking good. And I just remember thinking, Oh God, if I could just stay the same, you know, the the same strength. Well, for those that have seen game changers, I mean, you know, holy crap. I mean, no, I got so much better and stronger, but I do remember when I, made the shift in, in, like I said, is in my soul. I just, I remember thinking, this is good. This is goodness. This is love. Hmm. This is compassion. This is, this is empathy. Hmm. And it, good is going to come. I just had this, like, I didn't know for sure, but I just had this feeling inside that the, it, the way the world works it was not going to let me down the way the, 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 the universe works, the way the energy works, it wasn't going to let me down. This was not going to kill my Olympic dream. It just wasn't. So I had this like sort of like chip on my shoulder confidence wise that I kept inside. I mean, I didn't share it with anyone, but I just kept thinking, nope, at every juncture, nope, this is going to be good. This is going to yield something. I don't know what, maybe it's just staying the same. Cause that would have been like, that would have been okay. Um, but it, it, I was right times a thousand because Holy smokes. I, I, I just, what I was able to do on plants was astounding to myself, to my coaches, to the other guys in the gym, watching me lift. Now, could I have done it on animal foods? We'll never know. Maybe, mm-hmm. but the point is I did it on plants. So that's, you know, yeah. And, and I, I am not, you know, like I, I know you were on impact theory with Bill. You, he is like, poof, when it comes to like the, his memory and his knowledge on all of this stuff, I am, yeah. I'm not that guy at all, but I do know that there is obviously a movement with the growth of keto. There's a movement to carnivore diets. Mm-hmm. Um, I've also seen other people have miraculous, um, health transformations on, on just high, um, complex carb diets. And so, so yeah. I am, I am, of the mind where I'm I'm uneducated, but I'm of the mind where it's like, possibly it just comes down to selecting something and staying with it. You know, a plant-based diet eliminates certain things and lets you focus on the things that matter most. Uh, Mm -hmm. Even someone who chooses to like lose weight through high comp, high carbs, like a high diet, like they're eliminating things and focusing someone who goes with Mm -hmm. carnivore or keto, they're eliminating things and focusing. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I know that I'm now removing compassion from the argument and focus mainly just on nutrition and things, but um, is, is the path to health and performance really just actually about limiting certain things and focusing perhaps? I think that is that part of you that your food coach is talking about, right? Like, <laughs> like, <laughs> right? like you want there to be like, I want there to be an answer. And, yes. And it's not just like sort of a freedom. Uh, cause for, for me, even if you exclude, it's hard to exclude the com- compassion from my well, I, this your argument, mission. but sure. it is, but it's, it is a, just coming from where I came from and coming from anorexia. Uh, I don't want to have anything. I don't want to have any rules around food. I don't want to be weighing my food. I don't want to be measuring my food. I don't want to say I can't have this or I shouldn't have that. Like that is, was the essential uh, you know, mission of my therapy. And we got there and I was eating animals then, you know, it was like, I said to her almost in day one, I just, I would love to get to a place. And I, I know that I never will. I mean, I, I, you know, I didn't believe that I was actually going to get all the way better that there's nothing that can't be on my plate 
right? Like I, I just, that whole restriction. Um, I know every calorie and every food, sadly, because of my, my disorder, you know I mean? I learned everything I know. And so now, and, and obviously the compassion comes in because animals are now not food to me. Mm -hmm. They're just not food. They're, they're beings. They're alive. They're my friends. And I don't eat my friends. So given that that's the case, given that that animals aren't food to me, uh, there is literally nothing in the world that I can't have. So it's very unrestricted for me. It's like, I, I can have anything I want. Uh, quite literally all the not, food, not as and, much as you want. Right. Oh no. I eat, okay. I have a huge appetite. I, I, I still have almost the appetite that I had before. Um, and that is the really interesting freedom of a plant-based diet. It's so nutrient dense because it's, you know, mostly if you eat a whole food plant-based diet, right? Like not, we, we can talk about that all day long, right? The back and forth between like, of course there's processed animal foods and processed plant-based foods and the processed plant-based foods might be a little healthier I'm, than I'm animal foods, but I'm it's all still food. gross. Yeah. I mean, I'm on yeah, a whole it's food whole diet foods. It's and whole right foods. now I, my only pro, my only, um, animal products is I still, I'm eating eggs and I'm eating chicken breast, but otherwise, mm the other 3000 calories I'm having a day are, yeah, are you're doing it whole foods, nuts, vegetables, uh, stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, there's it, to me, it's the, well, you, you obviously can eat so much more volume mm -hmm. unless you're just eating, you know, constant avocados and walnuts, like, you or know, dates. It's, it's, <laughs> I love fat, dates. yeah, like, right. They're amazing. <laughs> I mean, but most of it is significantly more volume. And I like, I like volume. I like, I, I, yeah, I have a big appetite. So, um, it feels very satiating to me and it feels, I feel very full and very whole and, um, not restrictive at all. I mean, that is again, a rule from my past. Like I will not restrict anything ever. What's been very interesting about a uh, whole food plant-based diet is, uh, it, I don't have a sweet tooth anymore. I, I used to have a pretty, pretty good sweet tooth and it's just disappeared. I mean, I'll have whatever. If I, I love a vegan donut. If you're out in a cool city somewhere and they've met you because it's so exciting when anything makes, you know, anyone makes anything vegan, you're like, oh my God, I have to try it right now. Um, but just generally speaking on an everyday basis, like I don't crave, you know, you know, any, anything sweet during the day or at night, which is kind of, which is, which is just kind of, I guess, I don't know, nice because sweet would normally be maybe not super whole foods as healthy, but if I craved it, I would have it. And when I do, I do, but it's been interesting to see my sweet tooth melt away, um, by my food choices now. So hmm. I love that. And so uh, as you progressed through your training, as the Olympics became an option, um, mm -hmm. I, I mean, I, I, I would, I'm assuming again, but you were, you were old, you, you started your career later. You were mm -hmm. one of the oldest women in your sports, if not the oldest uh, podium ranking athlete in, in your field. Um, you're doing this stuff with plant-based diets, which is going against the norm. Uh, what kind of doubt or fear were you facing aside from, I guess, the typical athlete's performance anxiety? Imposter syndrome. Imposter Big syndrome. Time. Big time. Cause I started, like you said, late, I didn't pick up a bike till I was 26. And, uh, you know, I was, I didn't grow up thinking I wanted to be an Olympic athlete, like, like, you know, maybe gymnast or swimmers or, you know, ones that start when they're little bitties. Uh, so it was never in my sphere or in my dream. I loved watching the Olympics, but that was about it. So when I got there, it just felt like I was, um, acting, and so oh, it, it, was, it was, it was like very intense imposter syndrome, uh, to the point where I would go to, uh, you know, other countries, world cups that world cups or, you know, world championships or whatever we'd be traveling to in the, in the track team. And I would have this whole experience where, um, the, the track is, you know, similar to the running track, except it's banked 44 degrees and super scary. Uh, but it's like a fishbowl. You feel like everyone's staring at you because they might be, but they're not just staring at you. This is all of us in the middle there. And it's, so it's, it's, I, I found it very nerve wracking because I raced on the road for 10 years professionally before I went, moved over to the track. So I was, it was used to, to that. So it was very fishbowl-esque and 
uh, it really brought a lot of, uh, like I talked about earlier, anxiety and nerves up. And then this imposter syndrome that I just kept thinking, I don't know when they're going to find me out, you know, like at, mm. at some point before the Olympics, they're going to come and, and be like, you get out of here. You know, we are on to you. So we would be at a world cup and, you know, when you're nervous, you pee 87 times or I do. So I was always going back and forth to the bathroom, you know, on the rollers to the bathroom, on the rollers to the bathroom. And I would have this really intense visualization in the bathroom that I could push a button and the bowels of the restroom would open up and I just could be flushed down and, and, and then I would just disappear. And then no one would know what happened to me because I wouldn't want to actually go, you know, like off myself because that would be terrible for it's it, it, I had a whole system that yeah. I had in my head if I could, how I could just disappear so that I wouldn't be found out and the embarrassment wouldn't happen to being found out. So yeah, that was a, it was a beast to get over that imposter syndrome. And so how did you overcome that? Well, I haven't. Um, I'm, I, it's showing up in uh, leadership. I, I almost mean, in, <laughs> I almost mean in the moment, like, um, Oh God. Right. This is, okay. this is a, again, like, uh, we bought this house seven years ago. There was a TV uh -huh. antenna, a TV antenna at a house, which I had four people come to, to try and give me a quote to take it down and no one would climb it. It's like 60 feet tall, super dangerous. Oh, so after all these years, I go, okay, I'm going to rent a lift. So I rent this 60 foot lift, get myself a harness, go up in the lift. Oh my God. And I'm getting myself, you know, six stories up. So I'm getting myself <gasps> Uh, so I'm going over the house, over the garage, 60 feet up. And at first I'm just getting comfortable. I spend about 20 minutes. I come down. I go, okay, I'm okay. getting comfortable with it. Then I go back up. And then now I'm like at the top of this TV antenna and I'm looking up, there's like 10 feet of like metal and stuff. And I have a friend with a rope. And at a certain point I realize, like I'm, I'm holding on to things. It's swaying in the wind. I'm, I'm petrified. But at a certain point I realize it's like, I have to do this or I have to go back to the end of the ground and not do it. Like I'm at the point where I do this or I don't. Yeah. And so I have this saw and I start cutting and it's like, and this, and the tent is moving all around and I'm worried I'm going to get hit in the head or something's going to happen. And I cut the first pillar and nothing happens. And I cut the second one, the whole thing shakes. And again, it's this moment of like, you do it or you mm. don't. And I telling myself, I have no choice. I have no choice. I have no choice. So I'm cutting it. And it starts to go and it's just like in this moment and then it's victory. I did it. I faced my fear, but, Oh my God. But, um, it was one of the, this was just two weeks ago, but it was so poignant for me because every step along the way I was terrified and I had to force my body to act. I had to like tell my hands move step. Mm -hmm. You're okay. Nothing's going to happen. Like, and, and most of the time I would just put it off or hide or run away. And so I'm curious, like in that moment, you're in competition as an imposter, you're running to the bathroom, you're, you know, you're, you're grabbing your bike, I can imagine you're walking or it's being prepped on the starting line, you're clipping in all of like, all of these things, where how do you force your body to do the things your mind is telling you you can't do? Or is there training that just kicks in? Are there certain things that just kick in and you just kind of do it? Right. Well, first of all, I didn't actually, yeah, I didn't have that button in the bathroom to disappear. So I, would, <laughs> otherwise you, you would know, have just ran away. I, mean, right, I could have pushed it. There's a real, so that wasn't real. So I just kept coming back out of the bathroom, but absolutely it was in the mental training because I had many times when it did take over and I lost the race. I mean, it, mm -hmm. it definitely won multiple times leading in. Right. So I, I had to, I just, I had to do the work. I did a lot of work uh, to get to that place where I could, perform and I could take my opportunity, my three minutes of opportunity and put on a show. Yeah. I mean, that, that I really was able to finally, and it took a long time and a great sports psychologist and a ton of work and a lot of meditation and a lot, all everything and teammate support, but to be able to, to turn that fear and that imposter syndrome almost into an attitude Mm -hmm. And I got to finally, by the time Olympics rolled around, it was like, this is my time to shine. I've put in the work. This is my opportunity. You better watch out, Brit Britain. You better watch out, Australia, because we're coming for you. Like I was able to really turn it into, you are, our competitors are screwed because we are good. You know, that, but 
God, that took a lot. It took a lot of work. It's, oh, it's I not, love, you know, I yeah. love that because you just gave me goosebumps because that's what we see on television. That's what we see in the package. That's what we see, you know, when you have the, the mic yeah. shoved into your face and we want, we, the people want you to have so much confidence and so much attitude, yeah. to, like watch what we can do. But meanwhile, every time I talk to an athlete, they're all like, oh, that wasn't the case at all. And so I almost, um, you know, people talk about, you know, Tony Robbins talks about like stepping in, you know, the two, the 2% mm -hmm. difference, um, you know, those, those, those two inches of difference, uh, as well as like putting on the persona. Um, I, I love that it can be worked through and manufactured and created, but mm -hmm. still be real to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You said it great. <laughs> I think to add to that. So, so then who, then why doesn't that show up in business for you? If you still got the imposter syndrome in business and leadership and things like that. You know what? Watch out farming industry. <laughs> know, exactly. Watch out government lobbyists. <laughs> it shows up big time in that aspect of it. Where yeah. I struggle is in like leadership with the team. Mm. Um, I'm extremely, uh, independent and I'm extremely introverted. And so this, yeah, running a small team is uh, that that's where it shows up. I don't love that part of it is, is, is part of the truth. Mm. Uh, you, you know, there's other aspects to run but, that team for you then. Yeah, I, I have that. Yes. It, but yeah, I know. <laughs> and they have, but it didn't, that's not, it wasn't an answer any either a hundred percent, but we just, yeah, obsessing through it, figuring it out. Like I don't, I don't have imposter syndrome when it comes to the actual work that we're doing, the yeah. fight that we're waging, yeah. the battle against the status quo, like that, 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 that I don't have imposter syndrome. It's like, that's all me. If anything's me, that's me. <laughs> you know, I know that. Yeah. That's my truth. So I, I went to film school. I'm, I'm 10 years younger than you. So when I went to film school, one of the big things that was just out was a documentary called the corporation. Mm -hmm. Not sure if you ever saw it or not. It's, it's an older documentary from maybe 2000, 2001, but um, I didn't, but I think I want to. <laughs> well, it's, it was, it was of the vein of, and I can't remember the name, but there was a big food documentary that came out um, maybe in 2006, seven or eight about um, farming practices yeah. and things like that. But is it like the, food ink or something. Yes. Like food ink. Yeah. So, it was right, like, right. it was, it was before food Inc, but it was all about the history of corporations and what's wrong with it. And it got into the whole Monsanto mm -hmm. milk issues and yeah. um, just how corporate structure really pr is prevalent. And even at mm -hmm. the time, the fact that it's like, if you trace all brands back, it's down to like eight major corporations at the time. Um, and, and just how everything is really structured. So at seeing that, you know, when I was 20, maybe um, I went, oh man, this is terrible. And then mm -hmm. I immediately went, oh, I don't think there's much we can do about it. It's just like, the more you learn about government, the more you learn about regulations, the more you learn about big business or big mm -hmm. pharma or uh, medicine or the education system, everything is skewed against what's right, in my opinion. Yeah. Uh, and yet it's just like, I don't think there's much we can do about it. And even with your starfish analogy, right? The girl going by on the beach with the starfishes mm -hmm. and there's thousands of them and she throws one in and someone says, that's not helping. And she says, well, at least I'm mm -hmm. helping that one. Mm -hmm. um, it still seems so hard because if you do not have a lot of money or a lot of focus, mm -hmm. chances are you are not going to be focused on food or making smart food decisions first. Mm -hmm. because you're going to be focused on all these other areas of your life that may seem less important. Um, I don't know why people aren't taking better care of their health. I don't know mm -hmm. why people aren't making mm -hmm. better food decisions. I don't know why um, everyone's so quick to go on medication or find simple answers. I don't, I don't understand these things, but how do we, like you're fighting mm -hmm. a really big fight, a really mm -hmm. big fight. Yeah. It's, it's, it's kind of going back to what we were saying earlier. I, 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 in the, in the day when I'm in the fight, it's the most important thing and it's everything matters so deeply. And then when I shut it down, I go into nothing matters at all mode mm -hmm. in a way. And I, I mean, I, that, it's been a practice because it's so massive 
that it seems pretty insurmountable. It does. Uh, and so it has to be the yin and the yang. Everything matters intensely. And then at the same time, nothing matters at all because we're just spinning around on this blue globe that who knows when it's going to blow up. Is that or not we, defeating to you? Like, like I can no, get everything matters. Is it? Because It me, really it's- is because it takes down, and this is back to, it takes down the magnitude of it for me. Mm. Right. If it's so magnificent and so, um, you know, all powerful, then I, I think I feel like, no, I, I, I don't know if I can make a difference. So it balances it for me. I have to take down that magnitude some of the time to do the work, but not all the time. So sometimes, like I said, I'm in the mode of this deeply matters because it does. But then in the end of the day, maybe nothing, maybe none of it matters at all. Um, and then I just also... I go, what, what else would I do? <laughs> I will not be able to stop fighting. And you do that because we all do that with ourselves and whatever we're doing. And if you're truly in something that your heart aligned with and you love and you believe in, I go, what I, nothing would ever measure up to what this feels like for me. There's nothing. So it's like, I just kind of go, well, you know, you're stuck. Like, this yeah. is you. Like, there's no option for me not to fight for this. I can't imagine not waking up and fighting for this every day. So put on my boots, you know, yeah. strap it up and, and go. And how do you, so, so I, what I love as well is, so you have the career, in, you know, you, you, have, you have the career in cycling, which helps give you uh, a certain level of notoriety. Um, it, it exposes you to certain people. You have a certain following. Um, you carry yourself a certain way. You have access to certain training. All of this stuff is amazing. Um, how do you go to, I'm going to dedicate my life to this and not, and like figure out the finance side of things, which is what holds most people up. They won't commit to their passion or their mission in life because how do I make money? Where does my revenue come from? Like, like just yeah. how do you, how do you go from doing this to doing the next step and not get held up with finances, with revenue, with money, with like, Mm -hmm. like you're focusing on the mission. Yeah. This may go against what everybody that's ever been on your podcast says, but I'm not a big, I'm not a big goals person. I'm not a big, like what's the next three years. Like what's the next five years look like? Where are we going to be in 10 years? What am I, am I going to be in 10 years? I wasn't like that as an athlete. And I'm not like that now. I'm very much an in the moment person. And I very much have a belief system that, uh, if I'm doing good and I recognize that it's, it's my belief that, 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 that I'm, and that I'm doing good, um, that the next step, the next vehicle to the next success is, is, is going to show up. So when I started switch for good, I didn't start it as an organization. It started just as an idea. It just started as uh, well, really it started with the middle finger from me because I was so sick of these milk ads. I was so tired of being inundated with dairy at the Olympic training centers. Cause it's, it's the U S Olympic committee's title sponsor. Uh, I was so tired of being fed this lie and this perpetuation of this belief and their marketing. And it's all it is, is marketing. Um, that I said, somebody's got to stand up against this. Somebody needs to say something. And then, you know, 24 hours later, I was like, Ooh, I wonder if that's me. I wonder if I should stand up. I mean, I'm the one feeling so passionate about it. So uh, it was right around winter Olympics time in 2018, Pyeongchang Olympics. And I said, what if we put a commercial on the closing ceremonies of the Olympics where people have been watching milk ads for two and a half weeks. And it's just like, we don't need milk to win medals, like wake up. It was, so I, it was seven, you know, plant-based vegan Olympians from four different countries. And we put this commercial on. So it was not a nonprofit. It was just an idea. And then, you know, it just be, it became, you know, it was kind of a force within itself. The dairy industry got it kicked off of NBC. It was the whole thing, you know, again, follow the dollars, right? They're, they're, they're marketing dollars and they have $91 million a year to spend in marketing. So it's pretty, they spend a lot of money be, on NBC. That's going to be your 30 second ad, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, how do you go up against that? Uh, so it, it, it just started unfolding as this is something different. This is something special. This is something that the movement is not necessarily doing, doing me, meaning, um, really high level athletes standing up for a cause and a reason and against a very specific animal food. Uh, not all of it, but this one, uh, that we've been lied the 
most to about. And it, it just started developing and the funding came in. I mean, I asked for it and I went for it, but it, it, it you know, I, I, I didn't, I didn't have it set up of the five-year goal. I will be able to bring in $2 million for my nonprofit at the beginning. I, I never did that. And, and so I, I'm rarely disappointed since I'm not a big goal setter, which I think is part of how I stay so um, positive and furious and, and, and gritty. And, you know, cause I'm, I'm very, I'm, I, I, yeah, I'm almost never really disappointed it, when I am, it's like, Oh yeah, I could have saw that coming that, 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 you know, that's just an obstacle. It's not like the end of this. So I just, yeah, I, I, I never have been, I have no flipping clue what's I'm going to be doing in five years. Not, I don't I'm not even curious about it because it's just going to be what it's going to be when I get there. And I just, I like to stay in the, in the now. And it's worked out for you that way. Well, so, so, so far. So yeah, June 23rd, 2021. I'm still, I, I I'm still ask, a very big fan. I ask out of hope more than anything. <laughs> Again, it's like, if you, if you move forward, you know, like I have this saying that I say to myself, I don't really publish it too much, but it's just like, it's like make bold claims, do cool shit, back it right. up with action. You know, make bold claims, yeah. do cool shit, yeah. back it up yeah. with action. And that people will want to follow that. Um, yeah. And I, I, the same thing that I get inspired when you go like, I'm going to show Britain and Australia that they do not own this. Cause we are here. Like, like that, that level of confidence. I just like, yeah. I just desperately want and want others to have. Um, and so when yeah. those few moments that most people have of inspiration of, of, of feeling really alive, most people will cancel it out. will ignore it will not take action on it mm -hmm. if you do if you do like you know this didn't start out like a big thing for you it started out on a mission and then it became a 30 second spot and then it became something more mm -hmm. and so it's like just pursue that stuff and i want i want to know the whole collection of everyone i've interviewed is just like please just remind me that if you do these things it will work out maybe not the way you want Yes. The way you're planning. Yes. But, but That's you will key. look back and connect these dots and it will be amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's the key part, right? Because even if you're not, you know, a three year plan, five year plan, 10 year plan, goal setting person, you're still, your subconscious still um, plans, organizes, and categorizes where you would be then. Like it yeah. just does that when you're, when you're doing, you know, so it's hard, it's hard to, to completely get away from it. So it's, it's easy. You, you get easily disappointed, you know, when it's not exactly as you thought it might be, but I always find it, it usually turns out better than what you thought it was. Cause, cause we tend to underestimate, hmm. you know, tend to anyway. And yeah. so uh, everything so far for me is, especially in this is um, it's been way harder than I thought it was going to be the, the running and organization part uh, way harder. I was <laughs> Yeah. I just, uh, yeah, it is. I had to get, I had to go back to my therapist, different therapist now, uh, and get a career coach. And I have just <laughs> I hired all this help because I was like, what is wrong with these people? You know, no, it's, you know, probably me, but you know, it's of course it's, I like to think it's them. Uh, people are not all the same, right. They're not cut from the same cloth. They're not exactly like me. I just thought people, you know, they, came to the table, they, you know, they applied for the job, they came to the table, their mission aligned, we're just going to do the work. And that's about it. Like, I, nobody's here to be each other's best friends or sisters or moms or dads. It's just like, let's, you know, just march. I'm very soldier like in my approach to kind of my day to day, you know, it's like, we're, 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 we're in a battle. So we're just, you know, we're marching forward. Turns out, not every personality is like that, you know, like they're looking for quite a bit of other areas of fulfillment in the, in the work and they want to, oh God, I, it's just, yeah, I just couldn't even believe that everybody doesn't bring their best self every day. Like that's what I, I did as an athlete. And I'm not saying, oh, I'm so great for that. It's just, it just seemed like if I was going to go towards a big goal, I needed to bring my best self to training every day. Now my best self oftentimes sucked, but it was my best self that day. And my teammates knew that. And I knew that about them. And that's what really created such a cohesive team with so much trust of one another. I knew they would always bring their best. Well, it turns out that's not how everyone 
one operates. So I was, that was just blew me away. I'm like, what are you doing? Did your paycheck show up last week? It did, right? I thought so. What the fuck are you doing? <laughs> It was, it's, I'm a mess. Is it? Yeah. It, it, it's just been a crazy challenge. Um, I, so trying to, trying to learn that bit and, and, and improve and get better. And it's taken a deep, a, taken me to take a deep dive into, into me and, you know, all of the weaknesses and idiosyncrasies that I have, and I guess, you know, leadership and, you know, and you don't, you don't get lost in that. You don't spiral into the neg. I mean, you hire some coaches, you work through mm-hmm. it. No, no, I've, I've spiraled on, on it from day to day. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Like really heavy stuff. Like I am, have always my entire life been a world champion sleeper. And for the first time in the last year and a half, um, I've gone whole nights. I can't, I can't, I can't sleep. I absolutely have spiraled. Yeah. It's been, it's, it's been a bitch. Uh, huh. It's, it's really been hard. And you would, th- I mean, way harder than the Olympics. And part of that is, you know, my extreme independence and introversion, right? Like that being an athlete is, is very tunnel vision. It is very much set up for an independent type of personality. Um, and so if you look at, you know, like on the predictive index, like the opposite of independent is collaboration. Well, it turns out when you have a small team, you have to collaborate. <laughs> so it's just been, a, it's just been a wild ride trying to figure it all out and, and understand it better and, and see how I can be my best version of a leader while I am a independent inter- introvert. That's an empath. Like it's not, it's not the DNA that you want. If you're going <laughs> to lead a team, it's not I mean, all three of them are just really challenging aspects. So that is so interesting. I've, I've loved this time together. I mean, the, like the hour plus has flown by. Um, the, the, I want to ask you one last question. Um, so for you at the end of the day, you know, we've covered a lot, we've covered everything, but just for you at the end of the day, what is, what does it all come down to? Justice. Justice. Um, and compassion. Hmm. Yeah. Really. And I guess, obviously I'm speaking about my work, but, um, my, with, with my family and with my loved ones and with the universe. Yeah. Th- those two things rise up for me almost every day, justice and compassion. And do you believe that you're making ends, you're making ends, you're making steps towards the proper ends? I do. I, I don't know if we're going to see an animal free food future in my lifetime, but I have seen some massive steps in the right direction in my lifetime, even just in the last 10 years. I mean, when I did this as an athlete, I didn't even know anyone else. I mean, I didn't even realize there was organizations fighting for this. I mean, social media wasn't quite as big. And so I I just, I didn't, I mean, everyone knows what it is now that um, 11 Madison Park, the famous Michelin star, multi Michelin star restaurant in New York City, just announced about a month ago that they were going all vegan. This is the pinnacle of cuisine. And overnight, they have a 15,000 person waiting list to get in. Mm. So 10 years ago, I'm pretty sure people would have been like, oh, what are you doing? You're right. And they would have closed their, you know, they wouldn't have made it. So it's happening. This always happens slower than you want it to in anything, right? But it's happening. Oh, man. I loved connecting with Dotsie. Her determination, her courage, her energy. It is so contagious. Okay, three key takeaways from this conversation. Number one, be a game changer. It takes courage. It takes strength. But have the courage to stand for what you truly believe in. Even if you get hate or if you get comments from the doubters, game changers they go against the odds. Number two, when the stakes feel high, don't get overwhelmed. Instead, focus on giving it your all, your full effort, your energy, everything you've got, you gotta put into what you're fighting for, and then do that every day and just keep on moving. And number three, separate yourself from the outsider's view of you. Stop thinking that people are watching every move you make, the wins, the mess ups, the losses. People are too busy with their own lives to just sit there and wait for you to mess up and fail. Now, if you have something to prove, 
to those doubters, to those haters, to that little voice that screams at you from the back of your mind. If that's you, you've got to face the difficult, the scary, and the hard things in your life. It's not easy. It's never easy. But remember, we, we aren't just dreamers. We're doers because we do hard things. If you need a shot of inspiration, you have got to hear the story of how this woman faced cancer and a divorce and then went on to chase down her dream to be on television, which she did. Click on the video right over there to hear this real inspiring conversation.